Welcome to those who've made it here tonight at our our person-to-person -person function and also those, some of whom live outside of Sydney who are on our web um, tonight and I think that includes Geoffrey Blaney, so welcome to Geoffrey and others. Now I'll just be very brief an in introduction. Margaret Cameron Ash makes a welcome return to the Sydney Institute. She was here a few years ago talking on an earlier book. <clears throat> but today on the occasion of the very recent release of Beating France to Botany Bay, the race to found Australia. Well, it's nice to be back at the Sydney Institute. And thank you for inviting me, Anne and Jared. And thank you for coming tonight, uh, and those watching at home. Uh, since speaking to you about uh, lying for the Admiralty, I'm happy to report that it's uh, on the CIA reading list. Uh, a senior analyst at the CIA called Robert Clark has uh, published a book called Geospatial Intelligence, Origins and Evolution, in which he cites my book in the context of, uh, context of Cook's uh, pat patriotic fake maps. Uh, now, it's uh, funny when you're young, you accept some things that on the face of it uh, don't really make sense, but you keep on accepting it until someone gives it a shake. Now, a sailor gave me a shake several years ago. Uh, he said that he had been in several Sydney to Hobart races and he couldn't understand why Cook, when he was in Bass Strait in 1770, didn't discover Bass Strait, didn't realise it was a strait. And there he was in the Roaring Forties. That spurred me to investigate, and uh, I've been asking questions ever since. Now, tonight I'll look at some of the highlights uh, that are found in this new and forgotten evidence. Now, we'll start at the, the end of the story uh, due to matters arising uh, in Glasgow earlier this year. I want to assure Mr Macron that Australia has enjoyed a very warm entente cordiale with France since the dawn of modern Australia. In 1788, as soon as Governor Philip moved, his, moved into his portable canvas government house at Sydney Cove, he immediately hosted a vice regal reception for Rear Admiral La Perouse, who was then camping down in Botany Bay. As reported by Arthur Bowes Smythe, the surgeon on the Lady Penryn, Philip sent two horses to Botany Bay to collect La Perouse and his friends. The following day, the four Frenchmen arrived. It was Wednesday the 20th of February, and they stayed for two nights, returning to Botany Bay on the Friday. I don't know if Philip uttered those immortal words, Captain La Perouse, I presume. But this has to be one of the most famous meetings in history. We'll now cross to London for the beginning of the story. Cook made his Australian discoveries about 16 years earlier, but nothing had been done about them. Joseph Banks and a few others wanted the government to occupy Australia. And which was the only way of getting a proper title to the place. At two parliamentary inquiries in 1779 and 1785, Banks suggested sending an occupation force consisting of convicts or American loyalists or both. At each time, he, his suggestion was ignored and Botany Bay was soon forgotten. A Pacific colony was just too difficult, both financially and politically. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, an emergency cap cabinet meeting was called for Friday the 18th of August, 1786, the magic date. It ran for 30 hours and at midday on Saturday, a dispatch rider was sent to Windsor to tell George III he would soon be reigning over a, an empire in the South Seas. So what triggered this? One is reminded of John Kennedy in 
1961. When he, or before he got to the White House, Kennedy was pretty much against uh, space investigations. Uh, he thought they were a waste of money, a waste of time. Uh, but then there was Yuri Gagarin and the space, and forced Kennedy to uh, announce within six weeks that he'd have a man uh, on the moon before the end of the decade. Now, something similar happened in eight, uh, 1786. Who threw that bombshell on Thursday the 17th of August that triggered the cabinet meeting the following day? After several years of research, I realised that it was John Ledyard, the brilliant and entertaining man from Connecticut, who had sailed with Cook on his third voyage, then went to Paris, where he became a close friend of the American ambassador there, Thomas Jefferson. Now, in mid-1875, Jefferson, like many others, was worried about the hidden purpose of the imminent French expedition uh, to the Pacific under the command of La Perouse. Jefferson didn't want any French colonies on his American west coast. So he asked the American, previously Scottish, uh, naval officer John Paul Jones, uh, who was also in France, to spy on the French port of Brest where La Perouse's ships were being loaded. Jones did an excellent job. He wrote a detailed letter to Jefferson. In brief, he said that Jefferson was instructed to claim possession in two areas. He was to build a seasonal base uh, near Alaska for French fur traders, and he was also told to establish colonies in New Holland. Jefferson was perplexed, and so he showed the letter to his friend, John Ledyard, who was the only man in Paris who had visited both New Holland, uh, it was Tasmania actually, and Alaska. After Ledyard had read the letter, he told Jefferson not to worry. There would be no permanent French col colonies in America. They were going to be established in Australia. Jefferson was relieved, and that could have been the end of the matter. But now we fast forward 10 months to early August 1786. Ledyard is still in Paris where he meets the Marquis of Buckingham, the first cousin of the Prime Minister, William Pitt. Buckingham recruits Ledyard to head a gun running operation to help the Spanish colonies in South America rebel against metropolitan Spain. This is a very funny story. The ship transporting the weapons is leaving the Thames on Friday the 8th of, 18th of August. So Ledyard rushes to London after asking uh, poor Thomas Jefferson for yet another loan. Now Ledyard arrives in London around the 12th of April, uh, August, and by the Wednesday, and by Wednesday the 16th of August, he has spent the money on two dogs, a tomahawk and a peace pipe. On Thursday the 17th of August, he meets Joseph Banks, with whom he has much in common, because both men sailed with Cook, and Banks is always keen to meet another Cook alumni. Now, it has always been thought that Banks was not in London at the time of the Botany Bay decision, because like most wealthy Londoners, in summer, he escaped the city, and uh, he was now down at his uh, villa near Kew Gardens. However, Banks was a clubbable man and always enjoyed a dinner party. So I fossicked about in the Royal Society archives and found that on 17th, uh, Thursday the 17th of August, Banks, as always, joined his friends at the Crown and Anchor pub in the Strand for the weekly meeting of the Royal Society Dining Club. The Royal Society proper had closed for the summer vacation but the dining club met all year round. I've included a photo of the dining club register in the book. The club rules stated that the dinner had to begin at 4.30 p.m. 
so there was plenty of time for the two Cook alumni to meet, which they probably did at Banks's house at 32 Soho Square. Here Banks, the charmer, and Ledyard, the show-off, probably spent an hour or two together, reminiscing about their old Pacific voyages and then discussed the prospects of the new French voyage under La Perouse. Ledyard would have boasted about his friendship with Jefferson and the letter written by John Paul Jones. Banks was flabbergasted when he heard that the proposed French colonies in, uh, were, going to New were going to be established in New Holland. Uh, but he was also very thrilled. He would have extracted from Ledyard all the information he could. Then as soon as Ledyard had left the house for his ship, Banks called his carriage and raced across to Whitehall to tell William Pitt. Immediately, the cabinet meeting was called for the following morning. And history followed. So I'll move on to another highlight, which was Arthur Philip, which is why was Arthur Philip instructed to claim, claim half the continent when Cook's purported claim was just the narrow coastal strip. The western boundary of Philip's claim stretched right across to latitude 135 east, which, was, which is almost as far as Alice Springs. It was an audacious and outrageous claim. And the British government, of course, never attempted to explain or justify this claim. So we're left to guess why they did it. In 1914, uh, Frederick Watson, a historian, uh, suggested that the reason was that Whitehall was worried about the presence of La Perouse in the Pacific. And I think that's mostly correct. But, it, but in about the mid-1980s, some scholars developed an unrelated theory that had nothing to do with France. They said that Whitehall was being guided by the ancient Torcidies Treaty, agreed between Spain and Portugal in 1492, so very ancient, when it was blessed by the Pope. They go on to say that the anti-meridium of the Tordesillas line is the demarcation line on that beautiful map of Australia drawn by the English cartographer Emmanuel Bowen in 1747. It was the only real uh, map just of Australia uh, before Cook. Now, I think this is just a romantic story. For one thing, Queen Elizabeth I said that the Tordesillas Treaty had certainly nothing to do with England. Uh, and the Bishop of Rome certainly had no district, uh, jurisdiction over her or her country, and he had no right to tell her where her ships could go. And uh, so that was sort of that. The King of France said uh, much the same thing. He was Catholic, of course, and he was very upset that the Pope had admit, uh, omitted him from uh, the treaty uh, presence. For another thing, when you compare it with your school atlas, you see that the line on the Emmanuel, on Emmanuel Bowen's map does not run, uh, run down longitude 135 at all. It runs down longitude 136, which is far too far east for the strategists in Whitehall. Now, one may think that one degree difference is neither here nor there as there's only 67 miles between these two longitudes. But in fact, there was much more. There was the zigzag western shore of the Gulf of Carpentaria, containing a plethora of uh, river mouths. Now, any one of those river mouths could be the entrance to the imagined channel running from the Gulf of Carpentaria to the Great Australian Bight dividing the continent into two large islands. This imagined transcontinental channel or strait was one of the three main strategic jewels that Britain really wanted in Australia. The other two were Port Jackson 
and the insula Tasmania. Cook had found both of the, these and had quickly concealed them until they could be protected with garrisons. Now, returning to the western shores of the Gulf, consider the mighty Roper River, which could be the entrance to the mythical channel if you're sitting in Whitehall. That ri river discharges into Lemon Bight, named after uh, Abel Tasman's flagship. Uh, and it lies, Lemon Bight lies on the western side, the Dutch side of the line on Emmanuel Bowen's map. This was no good for Whitehall. La Perouse could claim possession and control of that river mouth, enter the mythical uh, channel, sail south to Adelaide, and claim for France the western half of the now bisected continent. So Whitehall ignored Bowen's map. Instead, they shifted westward, well away from the waters of the jagged shoreline, and into the dry land of the Northern Territory, where they drew the new Anglo-Dutch border at 135 degrees east. Now, I, I interrupt these highlights uh, to say that it would be wonderful to see this Anglo-French story added to the school curriculum when children are taught the story of modern Australia. There are many threads to that story, and Anglo-French rivalry is only one of them. But it's the thread that tells us why it all happened. It's also a rip-roaring yarn. The Battle of Port Jackson was possibly the most significant naval victory in the era of Anglo-French Anglo rivalry. The Battle of Trafalgar in 1805 has received the most glorification of any naval battle in history. But while it boosted morale, it decided almost nothing. It did not prevent the invasion of England because Napoleon had abandoned that plan months earlier. And it did not end the Napoleonic Wars, which raged for another 10 years. The Battle of Port Jackson, Jackson received no glorification, but Arthur Phillips' victory gave this country the evolving parliamentary democracy of England instead of the absolutist monarchy of France. Arthur Phillips' victory also shaped the history of Eastern Australia. Now, the, there are many other issues that didn't really make sense in school. For example, why was the first fleet sent to Botany Bay if it was Port Jackson that they wanted? Or why was the French government uh, writing new instructions for La Perouse and sent them across the courier, by courier across Siberia. Why did La Perouse sail past the tempting Sydney heads on his way south from Broken Bay? Uh, however, I'll, uh, uh, there's not time to do all of that, and, and so I'll just answer your questions if you have them. Oh, sorry. So many thanks uh, for that talk. We've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. And as I should have said earlier, the copies of Beating France to Botany Bay, the race to found Australia, um, are on sale tonight and they'll be on sale online as well. And I'm sure the author would be happy to sign them. And I got a quick response out of Canberra today. I said... Uh, What's the Prime Minister's response to the book Beating France to Botany Bay? And the answer was, thank God. Um, <laughs> and not Dieu merci. <clears throat> and so we come to a discussion. So what's all this about? What's this? Uh, is it Australia? Is it the Great Southland? Is it New Holland? And how do we get into these kind of arguments? Because I was talking about the Great Southland and I was told I was wrong. You, you, by you well, earlier. Yes, yes. yes I'm, I'm so sorry. tell us. Well, the Great South Land refers to the Im imagined, uh, what, the, the land the Greeks ima imagined, Terra Australis Incognita. It's, it's actually south, which is not what uh, uh, 
Australia isn't even the second southern land, it's about the third, I think, if not the fourth. Um, the, it was called Terra Australis Incognita, and as I say in my first book, it was actually, the word Australia actually appears on several maps, around about 1600s, 1700s, uh, on Antarctica, as it was then called. It was Australia. And what they thought was it was much bigger, and the reason they wanted it was they thought that at least some of its peninsulas would reach up into the uh, Pacific when people could live there and, and buy uh, English cardigans. But um, that, uh, and no one, there, no one in the 18th century confused it with New Holland. New Holland had been found in the 1600s. It had been circumnavigated by Tasman. Uh, Everybody knew it was there and it had the name New Holland, just as another country has the name New Zealand. Um, but after settlement in Australia, for some reason, uh, Flinders and his friends or Macquarie or someone decided that we didn't want to be New Hollanders. They're perfectly happy being New Zealanders, but we had to have a name change. And so we pinched Australia from Antarctica and put it there. And... That left Antarctica without a name for about 80 years. Uh, people tried to think, it had to end in A for Latin reasons, and people thought of Ultima and all sorts of things. And in the end, uh, they just put an A on Antarctic. And we don't have an Arctica, and we didn't have an Antarctica, but now we do. But, we, but poor, the poor thing was nameless for about 80 years. Tasmania was discovered, and I think Tasman knew it was separate, I have to say, uh, because when he tried to get around uh, Eddystone Point, he couldn't get round. He was just blown out of the, off the map, literally. Um, so I think he... But he wasn't telling anyone, just like Cook subsequently. And I think, uh, I think that Cook guessed that uh, that is what had happened to Tasman, just from reading his journal. And um, he wanted to prove it, uh, and so he did prove it, and then he quickly turned the ship back, saying no one saw anything, did they? And just kept on going off. So, Anne, I'll just... Um, <laughs> Margaret, um, we're, we're having this debate about, you know, the sort of issue that Jared was talking about, whether we call it Australia, and we have to... Our First Nation people have their say and whatever. What was the mentality around these men of London, these men of wherever Peru's came from, La Peru's came from, that they could sort of look at the globe and think that they could have it if they got there? I mean, it's a totally different mentality from today when we have most, well, all of the world mapped and we see different levels of ownership. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that mentality because you compared it with the space travel. Yes, yeah. um, it's a different mentality entirely. Mm. And, and well, we hope it is. Uh, well, the flag we, isn't big. But, but put on you know, it was there and no one was there, you know, terror notice or whatever we call mm. it. Um, give us an insight into how they saw their right to do this and, and the achievements that they planned with it. I think uh, the, uh, from the Spanish and the Portuguese onwards, I think they genuinely thought it wasn't so much as taking something, it was giving something. They were bringing God, they were bringing uh, writing uh, and a whole lot of other things. And uh, Cook and Arthur Philip were well aware that there were people, there was no terra nullius, there were people there and they both spoke about them. Uh, Philip in particular was very concerned about their welfare um, and he said, I'll keep them separate from the convicts because we don't want them contaminated by the convicts and, and all this sort of thing. Uh, after Australia, there was the scramble for Africa, of course, and then everyone went nutty and Germany unified and got in on the game. And so there had a big conference, I think, in the, um, was it the late 1800s um, where they made rules about who could take what. And I think it all sort of got itself sorted out then. And it's now just a completely different attitude. But I, I think that um, they did think they were benefiting the countries. Uh, although I have to say that when Cook was uh, 
approaching New Zealand um, on his second voyage, I think he said something along the lines of, I hope they don't settle here. Uh, I hope Europeans don't settle here because look what they've done to America, and which was an interesting uh, notion. We, we look at the whole scene now from the 21st century and what we know, as, you, as Margaret, as Anne said, about the whole globe, etc. What were the French, apart from beating the palms, what were the French hoping to get out of getting down to Australia? Because, uh, I don't know, they, 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 were they thinking they might find all sorts of um, new wealth down here? Or what was the mentality? I mean, the Poms had a definite reason for coming down here you know, as a landing place for a whole heap of convicts and maybe a few other things. But um, did, were there any tangible other ideas, uh, reason for the French wanting to get down here and grab um, this new land down south? After the, uh, their dreadful loss in the Seven Years' War, uh, they, when they lost Canada in particular, um, they were keen to have a southern hemisphere. They thought, we've lost the, the north, we'll go for the south, we'll try and get something in the, the southern hemisphere. Um, I don't think anyone uh, thought Austra Australia had tremendous wealth. They really only, only had reports about the west and all its wealth was hidden underground. Uh, they probably wanted a base. Uh, by the time they got to La Perouse, uh, they, they he was actually not told to go up the East Coast because Cook had done that. Uh, whether or not they accepted the um, claim of possession, I don't know, but they uh, were looking in particular at Tasmania and the land between uh, Adelaide and Melbourne, which they did at one stage name Terra Napoleon. Uh, but uh, I think they, Britain didn't want it. You know, the convicts were a cover. They, they were a very useful, uh, critical mass of occupiers, which is what you want. And when you're trying to shift people, as Stalin and others have found, you've either got to have refugees or you've got to have prisoners because nobody else wants to go. And you want a travel-ready group of people who just uh, will do, and preferably will do what you want at the point of a gun, which uh, you had the power to do uh, with convicts, not so much with the uh, American loyalists. And you see, they could have split ranks. That's what happened with several of the American colonies. They perished because the leadership divided. So the convicts were terrific, and you got your cheap labor, and, and everything, but the convict thing had been put up, as I say, in 1779 and 1785, and it was thrown out the window. It was too expensive, and the, the, more importantly, it was politically impossible because of the East India Company. And they had other, they had other solutions for the convicts. In, in 1779, they passed the Penitentiary Act. They were going to build Club Med all around the country and send the prisoners there to repent and become useful people. Um, the encounter between La Perouse and Arthur Philip is deliciously uh, enticing in terms of speculation about what they talked about. I note in your book you speculate, and I don't say that critically, that Philip may have banned his uh, colleagues from writing about the encounter in their journals. Can you talk a little more about what sources you do have about the meeting, and in particular, did you look at the French sources to see if what was reported on their side, recorded on their side? I'll speak about the French first. Um, I'm sure an awful lot was recorded, uh, but it went down with their ships. Unfortunately, La Perouse had a rule that when you're in a port, you can write about that port, but you won't send it from that port, you'll send it from the next port. He did this all through his trip. And um, it was a tragedy that ha that happened uh, in Sydney, because it would have been wonderful to have heard what they thought about the si about Sydney, which no Frenchman got to before they sent their last letters. Th those letters were all dated. Well, the latest date was the seventh of February, when they still had uh, a month to run, uh, and they still had to visit Sydney. Uh, and it, the box of letters was taken around 
to Philip on the 8th of February. Uh, why um, a second box wasn't sent about three or four weeks later, uh, I don't think it was Philip who uh, stopped that. I think it was Lafarouz just not wanting... Um, in, I think Lafarouz was probably right. I think the British probably would have read it. But even so, it would have been nice to have the letters. So that's why there's no French uh, report uh, on uh, that visit. As to uh, the uh, British reports, there is quite a lot. There's, there's uh, Bo Smythe saying he sent two horses across to Botany Bay to collect the Commodore and his suite. Well, that's pretty... Uh, uh, real. Uh, the, then you have uh, William Bradley reports the uh, Frenchmen, four Frenchmen have arrived at the governor's, for the governor uh, today. Then you have uh, wonderful Ralph Clark who uh, says, well he writes about them three times, he says they've arrived today um, and then one of them, Abby Mongay, he calls on Clark to inspect his insect collection and then he calls on Clark again on the Friday morning and says, please may I have a grasshopper? And Clark writes to his uh, wife, I couldn't give him the grasshopper because I'm saving it for you. Now, that's, that's almost as much as we get directly Oh, we, yes, and then Cl uh, Clark also says, and the Frenchman left this morning back for Botany Bay. The, uh, we also have a lot of indirect evidence. Uh, Collins, Hunter and Philip himself say things, uh, have conversations with La Perouse, they say we spoke to La Perouse, that they some of them could have happened at Botany Bay, but most of them didn't. And uh, so that is indirect evidence that... Uh, it happened. I'd just like to start by congratulating you first on your first book, which I <laughs> consider is the most interesting book on Cook, Cook published in the last 50 years. But I do have a special plea, yes. and that is I have a house full of books. Uh, my better half has ordained that no extra book can enter the house unless another one leaves. <laughs> Would it be possible, or could you consider releasing your books on ebook so we could buy a Kindle and have it that way and not contribute to the space in the house? I think that's um, probably more a question for, uh, for the publisher rather than the author. Could be, yes. Yeah. Um, but my other, my main question is. A brief main question. Uh, very briefly, um, it strikes me that you're right on the money with the second book. Would you agree that the meeting with banks? was the straw that broke the camel's back. That... Okay. Would you agree with that? You mean Ledger's meeting with banks? What I'm saying is uh, the Committee of Inquiry ha had plumped for South West Africa, mainly on the basis of lobbying rather than having a good case, but it was too close. They could send the ship Nautilus down there to check it out. And it had come back a month before to say that it mm. wasn't called the Skeleton Coast for nothing. Mm. So the government was really stuck and then this information... They weren't. Okay, they, got, to, got to move on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, they, they, look, they, after the Nautilus returned, there was a little more chat about other places in the Atlantic. They did not want to leave the, the Atlantic because of the East India Company. And uh, it was only when they, as, as Dal, Alexander Dalrymple had said, I don't want anything in my precious East India zone except for uh, if France is going to do it. France was going to do it, and that was it. I think it was a single item. Mm. Given the uh, contentious situation at the moment between France and uh, uh, us, I wonder whether you anticipate a big market for your book in France. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few, a few have made it to England, so maybe someone will send it across the channel. <laughs> So you, you mentioned briefly in your speech, and there's also briefly in your book, New Zealand. Uh, why, was, why wasn't there any interest in New Zealand? Is this unfair? No, it's, it's really the same reason there wasn't any interest in Australia. Britain was literally taken kicking and screaming to settle um, 
Australia, and it was the threat of France that did it. And I might add the same thing happened in New Zealand. Britain did not want New Zealand. It, it didn't want any more territory. Uh, it only wanted trade, no more administration. Uh, but that, and, and the New Zealanders were begging them to take it. They said, no, no, no. And then finally, someone had the sense to say, the French are coming. And they came. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Margaret, uh, a, uh, one interesting story in your book is about two alleged treasure islands in the North uh, Pacific of gold and silver, and they were, as it were, imaginary and fictitious islands, as it turned out, but tempting. Tell me, to what extent was, search, was searching for these two islands a cause of delay to uh, La Perouse? Uh, well, it certainly delayed him. Uh, he should have been, without those islands, he would have been here a month earlier. Uh, and he, uh, La Perouse was willing to ditch everything when he got the orders in Kamchatka, except these islands of gold and silver. And he did, he went across, he went across the international date line and uh, stayed there for 11 weeks. Uh, and it, I think it was a deliberately decoy by the Admiralty. Uh, they published a map of Cook's three voyages and they retained those ancient mythical islands when they knew they weren't there, but that they would be a, 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 a diversion for anyone else that was crossing the North Atlantic. And uh, the other decoy, of course, was Cook's and the Admiralty's and France's insistence on Botany Bay is where we're going. And that's all we ever know now. We're bound for Botany Bay, but they never were. They were bound for Port Jackson. Bondi, uh, Botany Bay was only a rendezvous point, but by focusing on that, they got La Perouse to sail past the heads. And if he had turned west, he would have planted his flag there. So, and he could have. Yeah. You say they didn't want the Great Southland Britain. It was too expensive or it wasn't in their interest. We didn't get history quite that way when we were being taught it. Yeah. But what was it about the French that made them suddenly ch ch decide they had to have it? I mean, what did they suspect the French would do with it? They, they were obviously suspicious that they weren't just using it for research. No. So what, did they think they were going to turn themselves into a new communist China or something? <laughs> <laughs> They, uh, I think, uh, I'm not terribly sure that the French knew precisely what they'd do with it. France was uh, feeling very buoyant. Uh, when the Americans said, will you help us uh, get rid of Britain? They said, sure, we'll. And they had won a war against Britain and they were feeling terrific. And they thought they'd do a, a, a Pacific voyage which would out, outshine Cook's. And, uh, they, were, they weren't going to the East Coast, as I say. They were going to try and find the imaginary channel. They were going to go around and they were going to see what the South Coast, which looked as though it was pretty good, the South Coast, and they were going to look at Tasmania. And they were probably just going to set up at a French base and it was going to be a new French empire and they'd spread out from there, but that would be their base, just as the Falkland Islands were going to be for a short time. Well, then, you know, the irony is that because Britain did expand more than France, you know, the empire upon which the sun never set, yes. um, Britain kind of outdid the French big time in the 19th century. Can you explain that? Uh, the French always had very good ideas. They usually beat the British on ideas. Bougainville beat Cook to Australia and so on. They were not good at execution. They... they just couldn't, they grabbed defeat from the jaws of victory every time, which was sad. Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> changed. What are we saying? It's sad for the French. Sad for the French. Well, Nothing's yes. Changed. Sad for the French. Yes. Now, in your speech, you made a comment about teaching um, the way history is taught in schools. So, how does that go towards your? The thesis you're talking about here, and your previous talk here about, I mean, what are our what are our children not being taught that they should be taught about these very early settlements and the competition between those two nations? Well, I, I think that's it. I mean, the, uh, my two grandchildren, well, 
one grandchild is, is doing, uh, I think he did um, uh, cook last year and he's doing the settlement this year. And they have all the predictable things. I mean, the, the other stories, are the, there's the convict story, there's the indigenous story, there's the environmental story, uh, there's the uh, free settler story, and all of that's terrific. Uh, but there are other stories, and one of them is the Anglo-French uh, rivalry, which is actually why we're here, um, whether we want to be or not. And uh, I think it would be good, and, and what's more, it's a happy story. We won. I mean, so, somebody won. Um, the, the, uh, it, 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 is a, it is a good shoot 'em up type story that children would like in the classroom. Do you remember going to sleep in your social studies classes? Um, yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> I think I dreamt through them. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> probably, not, probably not to be clear, but, um, mm. but we didn't learn much about the French, but we did learn about the British. No, but that's why it should be introduced. We learned about the indigenous, mm. although people say we did, but we did. Mm. I mean, I did, I don't know, I can't speak for others. But, um, so we're pretty well going to finish now. Have I missed anyone? So in terms of your previous book that you spoke here about, um, and since then, the CIA has got interested. Yep, absolutely. Which must be a plus. Um, and now your current book. Mm. What's next? Uh, I, I think that's it. I think that's it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> well, that's probably a good spot to end on. Yes. <laughs>